Hey there, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. I want to share with you this week an experiment that was run that really, really gives us insight into a phenomenon that I think probably anyone listening to this vlog can relate to and it really informs our food journey and how we go about trying to get our food in order and lose weight and do our food differently from now on. It has to do with the topic of whether we're choosing what we eat. So uh, let's dive into the subject of free will. I want to tell you about a neuroscientist from Columbia who was the chair of the Department of Physiology and Neuroscience at NYU, New York University, for 35 years. He uh, published over uh, 500 scientific articles, several books. He was an incredibly esteemed uh, neuroscientist. And in 2012, he really wanted to delve into the issue of free will, which has been a hot topic in the field of neuroscience for a bunch of years now. And he wanted to do an experiment that was of the sort that you just could never get ethics board approval for, because it involves going into the brain and stimulating it directly. And you're just not allowed to uh, open people's skulls and stimulate their brain directly. Uh, so what he did was he did it on himself and he had a graduate student help him. Now this is not that uncommon actually. Experiments that neuroscientists and physiologists want to run, they often do them on themselves because um, knowing that they'll recover and heal and it'll be fine is one thing. Convincing an ethics board to give you permission to do it to other people is another thing entirely. So here's the experiment that he ran on himself. He had his graduate student use an electrode and together they found the part of motor cortex that would cause him to point his toe forward um, on, on just one foot, like let's say his right foot, okay? Point his toe forward. And they coordinated together in time because he was going to resolve to flex his foot back. And they went one, two, three, go. <laughs> so she would stimulate his foot to point forward, he would flex his foot back. Now, what do you think happened? Well, her electrodes won and he pointed his toe. He wasn't that shocked at that. What he was shocked at was something else that happened in the midst of all this. And it stunned him and rocked him to his core so much so that he said, that can't be, do it again. One, two, three, go. And she would stimulate his motor cortex, his toe would point forward, he'd be trying to flex it back, his toe would point forward, but he was getting freaked out. And he said, do it again. Over and over and over and over and over again, they repeated this experiment. And she was saying, what's happening? Why, why are you so, why are you acting like this? Why are you so freaked out? And he said, I keep thinking that I'm changing my mind and deciding to point my toe. And so each time I redouble my efforts and resolve, I will not change my mind. I will flex my foot back. And I set that intention. And as soon as you stimulate those electrodes, I think I'm thinking, no, I'll just point my toe. And I think I'm doing it, but you're doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it, but my brain is convinced every time that I, at the last second, just think, no, I'll just point my toe. I changed my mind. I changed my mind. I'll just point my toe. And they published the results in 2012. And how this applies to me and you is that we have brains when they're hijacked that convince us that we decided to eat that bag of chips that we decided to eat that ice cream, that we decided to cave and have a beer and nachos with friends on a Friday night, that we decided to order the pizza. We have brains that convince us that we chose it. But I'm here to tell you that you didn't potentially choose it any more than you 
would choose to start breathing again if you were if you were resolved to hold your breath for longer than you physically can your brain would convince you to breathe at some point i often invite people to imagine a scenario where for some reason they really had to hold their breath for a long time they really they really had you know like imagine that someone's got a billion dollars in cash and they're going to give it to you if you can just hold your breath for five minutes right you know no matter what the stakes are at some point if you can't hold your breath for five minutes which most of us can't um you know you you will breathe again and you will believe you decided to breathe you will believe that you gave up and decided to breathe i think in a circumstance like that we would be aware that our brains have duped us that we didn't really choose it in the conventional sense of free will and choice because first of all, it's a very short term experiment, right? It's all happening within just a few minutes. So you really have your eye on what's happening. And second of all, we think of breathing as a deeply physiological, you know, brain stem generated activity, but food is no less deeply physiological, no less lizard brain-esque, if you will, right? And our eating, um, takes place over a longer period of time. And what I mean by that is the conditions that set up our brain to be convinced that we need more food happen on the order of weeks and months, not seconds and minutes like breathing. It Over a period of time, if your brain becomes convinced that you're starving, it will dupe you into choosing more foods and not just more foods, but the most calorically dense foods. And in our food environment, those foods all have sugar and flour in them, right? Oh my gosh. And so the consequence of that is that when you watch yourself choose to eat these foods, when you've promised yourself you won't, when you're so committed to eating bright or to eating according to the food plan that you've chosen that doesn't include those foods you feel like you're letting yourself down you feel like a failure you feel like perhaps you don't love yourself or you're not committed enough or there's something wrong with you fundamentally and over long periods of time and many failed attempts it can be incredibly demoralizing and lead to a lot of self-deprecation and even self-loathing and the niggling feeling that you probably have really deep-seated psychological issues. So what I'm doing here is highlighting the importance of getting your brain on board with your attempt, the importance of not having a brain that's convinced that you're starving, right? And one of the key factors in this is leptin and leptin resistance, right? Leptin resistance by definition is a brain that believes that you're starving to death. Leptin is the hormone that tells the brain you're okay physiologically, fundamentally, you have enough fat stores on board to survive. As soon as there isn't leptin coming to the brain, the brain believes that you've gotten emaciated and you've got to pack on weight or, or you'll die. And the trouble is, if you're hefty and, you know, and living with overweight or obesity in this day and age, what's probably also happened is your triglycerides are up, your baseline insulin levels are up, and your inflammation is up. And with those three things on board, no matter how much leptin is circulating in your blood, your brain can't see it. And it believes you're emaciated and it will trick you into deciding to eat the most calorically dense foods available. And so you've got to eat in such a way that the triglycerides, the baseline insulin, and the inflammation come down so that the insulin that's circulating in your blood already, thanks to the excess adipose tissue you're carrying, that generates leptin, which is great. You've got the leptin there. That's not the issue. You have plenty of leptin, but so that your brain can see it, so that your brain can see it, so it doesn't believe you're emaciated. So it's not going to make you believe that you chose to eat those foods and set up the terrible cycle of demoralizing failure yet again. 
And so this is where bright lines come in so helpful. Those clear boundaries that just say, I don't eat sugar, I don't eat flour. Why? Because when I don't eat sugar and I don't eat flour and I eat according to the bright line eating food plan, which includes a lot of vegetables, my blood is gonna get so healthy so fast, inflammation's gonna come down, triglycerides are gonna come down, baseline insulin's gonna come down, and suddenly I will have a brain that's not battling me and not duping me and convincing me that I'm choosing to eat all these foods that I don't wanna be eating. So it's a powerfully rewarding upward spiral of uh, action and reward when you eat according to the bright line eating food plan you give yourself a brain that doesn't need to do otherwise and that won't trick you oh my gosh so thank you Rodolfo Yanas that's the name of the professor Rodolfo Yanas L L I N A S he was from Colombia Rodolfo Yanas thank you for doing that experiment it's absolutely eye-opening and all of us are benefiting from understanding how the brain really works at these subterranean levels. It just, it's mind blowing how we can be fooled, but we can be, and it's very empowering to know that. So, especially when there's a solution, <laughs> right? Especially when there's a way to have a brain that's not hijacked and that will not trick us eating, into eating those foods. Oh my gosh, what a relief, right? Yes, so that's the weekly vlog. I'll see you next week.